Tonight's speaker is Barry Landau. He's been a member of the club on and off since the 70s. As clear as it gets. What's that? Sorry. And uh, has a good background in bromeliads and all kinds of other plants. And I think Barry should talk a little bit about what he does in terms of his uh, internet sites as well as his presentation. So, you are. Thank you, Ken. You just put the mic here. Lay it on that. Lay it there. I think it'll pick me up. Can, is it picking me up? No. Come on. No. Let's put this here. Hi, folks. Is that better? Can you hear me? I don't think this is doing much, but we'll try. Hi. Okay. What am I doing here? Been in love with Bermillion since I'm 10 years old. Been a member of this club on and off since 1973. So that makes 50 years of collecting and studying Bermillion. I uh, was brought here first, as it's traditional to me with all my talks, I mentioned my mentor. There's no photos. I can't find any on the, on, in the internet. And mine that I had of him were gone. His name was Rafael Maria Delgado, R.M. Delgado, but he was known to his friends as Frenchie. And Frenchie was the unsung 13th member of the founder of the Bermudian Society International. And uh, so, so Right after they ran it for the first year, he saw there was problems with people's personalities and he sort of gave up. But he continued to promote bromeliads locally in all the clubs and to supply all of the very first most important plant shops. Remember, there were no plant shops till the early 1970s. And the number one was called Mother Earth on Melrose Boulevard. And I was, had a job there when I was 12 years old. I'd already, uh, I'd already found my first bromeliad at nurseries called Icmea fasciata. And, uh, oops, sorry. So we're doing a couple different things here. Let me just explain. I'll get back to that in a minute. We're, we're, uh, it's not clear. We're, uh, sorry, hold on. That's better. All right, so we're going to be moving in and out of my computer, going online. We're going to go all over the world tonight, here, now. I have my hotspot on my phone, which I hooked back up so we could do this because they're overcharging me. Here's what it comes down to. Up until sort of 1965, there were no Vermilions in America, believe it or not. Very few. Uh, there was this. Icmea fasciata, there, which most of you probably have. There was Bill Burge Newtons, which we'll look at later. But the only reason we have this plant is because of people like Frenchie, and in, 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 co in cooperation with that, the person who actually brought this out of the jungle of Brazil was a nurseryman in Brazil named Alvin Sidel, who had a big orchid nursery. And, you know, locally in Mexico, Guatemala, South America, they have known about bromeliads for centuries. I mean, you know, witness pineapples. But they had also, there was also local usage of them for ornamental purposes. This goes back thousands of years. But nobody cared. They were weeds. So Alvin Cidel found this plant. Now, tonight's talk, as you might recall, let's go back. Tonight's talk is Bromelian species past, present, and future. Well, you know, we can't talk about all the species. There's about, currently, they guess there's around 3,200. Some people say 4,000. Others say 2,600. It depends who you talk to. There's a bunch, but it's not nearly like orchids. Orchids, which are fellow tropical plants that grow in, in the high layer of the trees, in the epiphytic layer, as well as on the ground. But the point is, there are about 38,000 orchid species, and it's actually the biggest family on Earth. You think, well, what about daisies? No. Nope. So the, what we're going to try to do tonight, I'm saying here hybrids, conservation, habitat destruction, extinction. And just so everybody knows that, uh, yeah, that is not a focus. She's right. That plant is from one of our shows here in Culver City. That is Neurogelia milagro which is a uh, Chester-Skotak hybrid. And this is already 
a ancient hybrid. This is like 30 years old now, but it was one of his most important you know, emerging hybrids that started, showed that if you did your work right, these plants had enormous potential. Now, you're gonna see, I'll show you a few plants. There are species that come out of nature that are what are called albomarginates. That's where you see the margin of the leaf has the white. And there are other ones with the modeling that you see towards the center, the patterning. Very few had both. I mean, almost none had both. The only other one similar to this, straight out of nature, that had both is, uh, hold on, it takes me a second or two because it's smaller than I need it to be. I apologize. So let's go to near Julia's. And Fireball Marmorata. And make it bigger. So, most of you, some of you, will have this. You may not have that form of it. There's about, I don't know, 20 forms of it. And they're all species, right? Now, near Julia Marmorata comes out of the Brazilian North Atlantic forest, which, what, over the last 150 years has been utterly decimated. I mean, you would be shocked. There's like 3% of the trees left. It's disgusting. And so, plants like this, and this is gonna be one of sort of the overall thesis of my discussion tonight. I'm gonna to try to give you the big picture on where we stand as collectors, as humans, loving these plants. So this came out of the forest. Well, if you go to the North Atlantic forest in Brazil, they're not there. They're gone. I mean gone. They were gone 30 years ago. Yeah, I might find an occasional one. Okay, I'm exaggerating. But basically, they're extinct. And this has happened time and time again, of course, with orchids and African violets, just nereids, you know, ferns, go on and on and on. We as humans are killing everything. And that's not news to you, you know this. So what I am doing, and I just determined this uh, the other day, I realized that as much as I enjoy doing what I do, and you, I think you guys know that I, I created this, uh, these crazy groups on Facebook. They're called the Planets. And the first one I built was Planet Vermilion. Then I wrote Planet Philanthia. And then I built 325 others. And right as of today, I have about 800,000 worldwide members. Planet Vermilion, as you can see, somewhere down here has, what is that, 21,000? 21,378. So, uh, the whole point was this. Uh, again, I'm gonna I'm gonna be nonlinear with you tonight. And I, I'll ho I hopefully we'll keep the, you know making my point. We have to find some way as a, as a plant society and as a plant club, and we to bring these plants to other people. I don't care if it's your grandchildren or your niece and nephew or if you the neighbor's kid. You know we do our lion's share. We do a good job putting on our show every year, and you know that it's hard. We, we don't do this, it's not easy for us. Most of us are elderly. But you can't imagine how important our show is for keeping this alive in Los Angeles. Right? You got South Bay, you got San Fernando Valley, but our show attracts a lot of people. So how does this all connect? You've got decimation of the forest, you've got decimation of the habitats, you've got remaining species, where? In our collections. Now, beyond that, I'll get back to the plant pavilion in a minute, okay? Beyond, plant, beyond that, uh, where is it? Where are they? Let's see. BSI. No, we want Selby. So you got the BSI, right? Vermilion Society International. It's a decent group, but it's tiny, meaning 1,300, 1,400 members. And so they're very limited what they can do as far as... Uh, money to actually do conservation. They are responsible for backing the main collection at the Marie Selby Botanical Garden in Florida. And there's a huge repository of species there. And that was overseen by Harry Luther, who is, you know, to any of you know who he was, he is our hero. He was a, a person, a botanist, who dedicated his entire life up until recently when he passed away to 
work to teach, you know, to research in bromeliaceae, in the family of bromeliads. And it came to a point where they no longer could employ him, and he moved and went over to Singapore to the to the big, you know, the big garden there, the new one. You know what I'm talking about, the the, the really uh, the billion dollar garden. And he was there for about a year and a half, and he had a heart attack. But Harry Luther and and the uh, collection at Marie Selby are maybe the only and the best collection of species on the planet. You've got. Uh, you know, smatterings here and there in the UC system, meaning UC, UCLA and, Ber and at Berkeley. Uh, you've got Kew Gardens in, in England. And you have in Germany, you have some good stuff, okay? For instance, uh, you've got Heidelberg. And so there's Heidelberg. This is their, well, that's their uh, website. Let's see if I got some pictures for you. Heidelberg is where uh, the, the, one of the, his name is uh, the professor there, sorry, sorry, Dr. Werner Rau, who starting in the 60s and 70s based his PhD on researching bromeliads. Let me get this out of your face. I'm trying to do about 20 things at once here. There we go. So uh, in the 70s, and you've heard uh, Pam Coyne, Pam Hyatt, to talk about taking her trips with Dr. Rao. But in the 80s, uh, it was eight, 1985, I was going to visit my father in Europe, and I took time to go to Heidelberg, and I got to town and I called ahead, and I, it's just a little side story, and I said, you know, I'd like to meet with, say hello to Dr. Uh, to uh, Dr. Rao. And the secretary said, well, come in, we'll talk about it. So I came in, and she said, who are you? I said, well, I'm a Vermillion guy. I'm the vice president at one of the groups in Los Angeles, and I've been doing this for 15 or 20 years, and I was just hoping to get access to the Talanzia collection. Because what it was is Dr. Rao was really a sort of a visionary. Whoops, sorry. Really sort of visionary. Yeah, you, you get the idea. He was in, he went to South America many times over his career as a, as a, uh, as a professor. At, this is the University of Heidelberg, remember, so it's a, it's a German university. But because of his standing in the academic community and because it was a <coughs> German, uh, you know, an, an official university, he was able to get special access not only to special areas that were hidden from other people, but he was given a special Compensation, uh, not compensation. He was given a special license to to send back a lot of stuff to Germany. Now you got to remember that these countries, by 1970, 1980, and by the emergence of what's called the CITES, C I T E S, the CITES Act, which was to protect endangered species, they were very sensitive to overcollection and to decimation and to being raped. You know, they were raped by the Spaniards, raped by the French and the Germans, whatever, in the 1700s, 1800s. But what it translated to in certain cases, especially in the 70s and 80s and early 90s, where people were going in, they would find a, a colony of plants and they would clear it, they would rape it, they would clear it out. It was completely insane. Pack them up, send them off, sell them wherever. Uh, so the point is, is that this collection at the Heidelberg Botanical Garden would boggle your mind. This, this is like, you know, uh, it's like some kind of dream because there's got to be at least two or three hundred unknown species being grown here that are still not documented because, of course, Dr. Rao died. He's got his students that were PhDs under him that are working on this slowly. But, okay, imagine this greenhouse going 100 feet that way and 100 feet behind you, totally with Tonanzias, and now do another one. And that's about 300 feet long, like a football field. I mean, it's crazy. This is probably half, well, probably one third of these are extinct in their habitats. So what's my point? Right? I'm, gonna, I'm gonna move you around in this nonlinear fashion, fashion and then tie this discussion to one idea. 
you don't have species, you ain't got nothing. Sorry to be kind of stupid sounding there. In other words, we all love these hybrids that we collect, but you know what? You don't have hybrids without somebody, meaning the hybridizer, who has a stable, giant species collection. Okay, so you have to have what? A property you own, a stable climate, or a hothouse. Then you have to make these hybrids by doing what? You cross two species plants, you wait one oh. year for the seed, you put the seeds in, you grow those out, you get little things like grass, whether it's Talantias or regular vermilions. Now, with a Guzmania, you can be from a cross to knowing what you did with the cross in about three to five years, three years. In other words, it'll go from a seedling to something where you can prove the genetic mix you've made in three to five years. Well, with a Talantia, you're looking at five to seven years for the little ones. For the bigger Talantias, it takes 15 to 25 years from seed to see what you've done. So, you know, when you have people like, uh, uh, what's his name in Arizona? Uh, come on. The great hybridizer gave up Talantias. Ah, damn it. I can't think of it. Dimmit. Mark Dimmit. I mean, he spent 15 years on them before he gave them up, and he did some great stuff. Like what? All right, so here's what it is. When you're... When you are trying to find out what it is you have. So I'm trying to impart to you some of the knowledge that's not that arcane of how to find something that you don't know in your collection. How do I ID a plant? All right, so the first step is if you have any idea whatsoever, uh, hold on, damn it, sorry. I have to move this. All right. All right. So this is the Florida Council of Bromeliad Societies website, fcbs.org. And down the side here, you can see it says genera. And so if you were to click on any given one of these, let's go to Talanzia, there's about 53 or 58 genera currently. And then in those, in, the, in each genera, there's a certain amount of species, right? As I'm saying some of this for you who are new to this. Now with Zeric or gray leaf Talansias, there's in the trade and in the known uh, uh, collections about 400, 450 species, give or take. And then there's, who knows, maybe three, four thousand hybrids around the world, maybe a little more. But that's because this flashes back, now go back to the 70s, there was nothing. But up until then, people like Frenchy, my mentor, and Jack Roth, and Victoria Padilla, they were at their own expense going to South America and collecting in a, what you might call, in a moralistic or an ethical way, meaning taking five or something, not 500. And they would bring them back, grow them out here in LA, and either give them to fellow collectors or sell them through our club. These are the people that started all this, that had the vision. Now, you also had hybridizers of other kinds of bromeliads in Belgium and France and Spain. And these were using the genetics of what? Stolen plants, essentially. Okay, they may have paid people in the country to help them pull the plants off. They have made, made paid export taxes. But those genetics are the unique uh, uh, thing of that country, okay? And this is emerging now, that what they did is steal the genetics. And what did they do with it? Well, the Dutch, it, they made a big industry out of it. The Dutch Vresias, let's get, let me give you something to look at, I'm sorry. The Dutch Vresias, uh, that we, you know, that we see all around. Here we go, watch. So we go here, here's Google, we go Dutch. Breezia, sorry. Breezia. Okay, and go to images. Okay, so here we go. What they did was, they said, well, 
you're not going to be able to grow these things to be around in Europe, so if we're going to sell the plants as a floral trade, we have to make them small, we have to make them able to go on a windowsill, and they targeted these and gusmanias because they were soft leaves, they didn't have spikes on the edge of the leaves, as you know, it can be a problem. And they turned this over time into a massive trade. Now, our hero in California that recognized this at the same time was Dr. Kent. That was the founder and the, the main uh, uh, mover behind Kent's bromeliads. And uh, when I was 12, it was the first time I went to visit Dr. Kent. He had his property right here, off the 405, right where the Howard Hughes Center is now. And it spilled down the hill, and he had all kinds of great stuff. And I bugged my mother, and she let me spend $150 of my future earnings, thanked her. And of course, Dr. Kent would give me $150 or $200 of free stuff. At the same time, I was getting my first plants were from Frenchie. And Frenchie had all kinds of good stuff. So if you have something like <coughs> Brigia Carinata, let's see what this is. I'm oh, sorry. Well, and that's just a, that's a drawing. And it's similar to Carinata. My point is, they, uh, Dr. Kent also realized that if you were going to sell these plants as house plants, that you had to work with the softer leaf plants. But he could do it, he could make the attempts at hybridizing because he had a huge collection that he had paid a lot of money to go collecting and you know to bring back in. To this day, Kent's generates a lot of you know very, very interesting hybrids. All right, back to this. So in Germany, believe it or not, uh Talansia, not necessarily regular bromeliads. They were purists, in other words. I'm not trying to make them sound evil. They're purists. So this collection in Heidelberg represents this incredible treasure trove. But as we have seen what's going on, whether it's Bolsonaro or other people, you know, other, you know, illegal miners, loggers, the, the uh, rainforest, the Amazon is going. That's not where a lot of these come from, okay? Yeah. Remember, the silver leaf Talansians come mainly from coastal forests, dry, rocky areas in Guatemala and Mexico. But you got to remember, keep it in mind, that this is only in the New World. Vermilions are a young family. What, 15, maybe 25 million years old? Nobody, they don't know yet. Nobody, you know, they, they argue. But so you got Florida, you know, Louisiana, Mississippi, a little bit in Arizona, not much. And then you got Mexico down to Argentina. This is the continent that gave rise to the plants we love. In the time that we have lived another 30 years, something like 20% of the habitats are gone, maybe more. We, we, nobody knows. Okay, so when you, all right, so let's talk about a little, let's get back down to earth here. When you want to know what something is, how the heck do you find it? Well, sure, you just go to regular Google, and, you know, uh, you can just type in T. Lanzia Ionantha. And you go click. And it's going to read Ionantha. Now remember, I'm in what's called the images. You see where the pointer is? And as long as you stay, you can go back to images, you can go out of it. But you're going to find that this has, you know, it'll tell you at the top somewhere, there's like uh, 800,000 images, okay, of different kinds of plants, the Ionantha. And you would potentially be able to make an ID using these, okay? So you have a lot of, here, look, here's a good image of, you know, probably Mexican, the Mexican one, who knows? Okay, so that's one way to find an ID, but if you don't know what what the heck the ID is of something? Let's say you just don't know anything. You go to, you just put Talansia in Google. Remember, this is Google. You know, this is, this is the one thing that the trillionaires have given us, and you should make good use of it. Go to Talansia, we go search. Now, right now, you'd think, well, it's, here's the, the search line, right? 
But it turns out, and nobody tells you this unless you figure it out yourself, that if you go over here, uh, can you see the, well, uh, damn it, sorry. One second, okay. There's the image I took off. But that could be a photo from your own phone or from your own uh, camera that you put on your desktop. Sorry, this is really pathetic, but uh, here's what it is. You grab this thing, and it knows. You see it says drop image here? Google knows you want to put an image search in. And you drop it in and watch this. Google finds you similar images. Now in this instance, it was an existing image already on Google. Yeah. So it only gives us one result. Yeah. <laughs> but, it, but down here, here's visually similar images. And if you had one that wasn't so well defined, you might have had 10 up here, okay? <coughs> but I'll tell you what, it's still harder in a way than what? Well, it turns out that between my being a top administrator and how he had a relationship in the early days, being 2011, I started these planets in 2010. I had it, I was, my groups were growing so fast that one, of, one day I get a call in an email and it says, this is John Tong calling from Facebook. I talk to you, I'm like, yeah, right. You know, I figured it's some crazy hacker, or some idiot Nazi off, the, off Facebook trying to, you know, screw me over. So I, I said, well, if you're on the email, I said, if you're real, give me a number to call through the regular Facebook phone, you know, through the regular phone system so I can ask for your office. And he sends me and I call him, Facebook, can I help you? <laughs> so now I'm going, oh shit, it really is this guy. All right, so anyways, the point is, he says, look, we would like to talk to you. We don't understand how you do what you're doing. Wow. He says, you don't have the biggest groups yet, but your groups grow faster than anybody else we know, except for the groups that trade, you know, use baby clothes or whatever. He says, you've got the fastest growing plant groups. And this is only when they had it, they only had about one point. 5 billion people. But anyways, I said, well, how about this? I'll record a video and let you know what I do, and you can tell me if it's worth something to you. And, gee, wouldn't it be nice if you paid me something? And by the way, I would like to be able to make money off my groups. Is there any way to do that? I said, I can tell you what advertising to put next to these things, okay? So, you know, right now you're not seeing it, but there, it, there's ads on the side of, wherever you go on Facebook, there's ads, right? That's how they make their money. I said, look, I can tell you which fertilizers, which kinds of plastic pots, you know, I will get you better click through on the ads you put on my pages and just pay me 2%. They're like, no, we don't pay anybody anything. We don't hire anybody. They said, the guys in our cafeteria are programmers. The guys who cook the food are programmers. And we don't hire anybody with programmers. All right. I said to them, look, I'm going to suggest to you some, some Improvements. Number one, which should be that if we, if you, oh, I, just so you guys know, whatever you post in these groups, so you know, it's just, I want to make sure you understand. Here's something that was just posted 10 minutes ago, okay? And this is a guy, Jesse Wong. I think Jesse Wong is either Singapore or Thailand, Taiwan. And he's showing us some great uh, uh, Ionanthus in bloom. And so what I said, I said to them, if you're going to keep a, if you're going to dedicate hard drives and storage to, to keeping on my group's archived photos, geez, wouldn't it be great if I could search them? Because in the beginning, you could go, you, now look to the left there. I'm sorry things are kind of small. I can blow it up a little more. Let's see if I can blow it up a little more for you guys. <laughs> it means i got to move around more. But, all right, you see over here? The members, you can see who's in the group. Events, that's if you have group events. Videos, photos. Okay, so if we go there, now, here is, you know, we're starting at the top. Here's today's photos, all right? Sorry, trying to make it. And now, if we scroll down, there might have been 50 posts already today. Well, let me put it to you this way we could scroll till all of us were dead and we wouldn't hit the end of the photos of Planet Talanzia. 
There's 15,000 photos in here. In other words, what, this, what, I, what we've amassed is, and because of me pushing them, and I had to repeat over and over, once, they, once I made my initial suggestions and they, they sucked the good information out of me, they dropped me, they sent me a $3 Chinese-made blue Facebook shirt, <laughs> shirt and 50 cent Chinese glasses. I mean, it's ridiculous. And I was just saying, send me a couple hundred bucks. Nothing, nothing. They're such bastards. Anyway, excuse me. So the point is that it took five years of ragging on them and sending in what are called bug reports. Because you can't talk to anybody in Facebook. How, how far are we? How, how much time do we have? Oh, 20 minutes? Yeah, okay. the over there. Okay. So, you know, you have a much better chance of talking to God than talking to anybody on Facebook. <laughs> or Google. Okay. Or, well, Google never, but Facebook, it can happen if you do the right things, like you claim you, you know, somebody's trying to murder you. All right, the point is, after five years, it just shows up one day. This little box here. What is that? Well, that's a Google-level AI-directed search mechanism, search feature. So if I go in there and I go, let's see, I go uh, October 2010. You can put in anything. All right, so now, now we're going out of photos, and look at this. Here's something from Barry Landau on October, well, this is 2017. What it's going to do, the search mechanism is going to give you things in my name, okay, that were older, and it starts at the youngest ones, that would be relevant, okay? But what I was trying to bring up for you was that there is actually a post that shows this this group was started and founded on this date. I'm not going to bother you with that. My point is that this, this search mechanism, combined with the 15,000 or more, let's go back to photos, it turns out that what, we've, what I have helped create, and, but believe me, 98% of this is the willing and active members. This is, this is only partly me. I'm not going to tell you this is my, yeah, I don't have such a big ego that way. Not even a chance. If I didn't have cooperative people spending their time literally photographing, uploading, going to Facebook, da 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 But you know what? This is probably the single best usage ever conceived of for Facebook. Because what? The regular feed that you would experience where the artificial intelligence being forces gobbledygook down your throat, political crap, religious crap, whatever it is, in my groups, the beauty of it is, what? You can only talk to Lanzians here. You can't be a Nazi. You can't talk orchids. If you want to talk orchids, you go to Planet Orchid. My point is simply that by accruing this huge database, here, you can put in a name that you think your plant might be. So you could start, let's say, on one of the retail sites. Uh, Talancy Abdina. You can put in plant Talancy Abdina. Sorry, get rid of these. So let's just do it. T Planzia Abdita. And we hit search. And what you're gonna get is any of a number could be 10, could be 100, could be more. These are posts from the past. Click on it, boom, you're there. And here it says who, these are the people that liked it. Here's the guy that posted it in 2014. And here's a perfect shot of, of, a, of a really common form of Talazi Abdita, which actually, there's about three or four or five forms, so you can get confused. So again, well, let's say, so, oh, sorry, that didn't work. I'll throw that away. We gotta click on this now that we're there. So now we go to the blow up of it, right? Now, let's say you're not sure that that's Salazi Abdita. You grab it off there and look to the far right. I know it's dark. That's my, that's my uh, desktop. And let's go out of there for a minute. 
Google search, and we go to images. Back to, oh no, I was already I was already here. I'm sorry. All right, we're there. So click this out. Where is it? There's a way to click it out. Damn it. Sorry. And this should be clicked out. So now we're right where we're in the Talanzia search mode, but with the images page. I come over here and I grab my Avdita photo and I drop it here. And you give the art okay. So <laughs> It's not working right now. It doesn't want to work for me. Let's go. T. Lanzi. Uh, well, we might have to put the right name. It's, you know, it ain't dumb, this this $100 billion computer they built. So let's go to Abdita. And here's different forms of Abdita that are currently on, right? That's, that's under all. Under all, you would get information, sales pitches, you know, access to technical information. Here's the images. Okay, we'll try it again. Let's grab Abdita. I may have grabbed the wrong one that time. Whoops. It just happened. We just don't buy that happened. Okay. Grab Abdita. We drop it here. And it's looking over a hundred trillion. And you know what's funny? Here's what's strange. Why did it find this one? going on? I don't know why it's doing that to me. Should be able to take it make it bigger. Let's pull it back off. And let's see what this is. Boy. No, it's just uh, my computer's freezing up. All right, you know what it is? I'm probably running too many, too many tabs. Let's just get back down to earth. Here's the point. Without having collectors like us, even our funkiest little collections, with few Bill Burgesses and a few like Mayans. You know what? You're helping preserve the species. So in the meantime, while the world is destroying everything, and our clubs and our society, by and large, uh, let's get rid of this, sorry. Uh, I have Talanzio. Why am I in the trap? There we go. What I, so, starting in 2010, I realized, you know what? For love or money, I don't care. For love, not for money. Somebody's got to promote these plants to the world. Nobody was doing it. The BSI is limited. The local clubs are great. I've always tried to support the local clubs. But my impetus was to remove the commercialism. You can't sell anything here. You can't buy anything here. You can't advertise. I have a separate group for that called Talanzia Buy, Sell, Trade. But if you put up with something to sell here, bam, and I get notified, bam, you're gone. So you can come here, you can be a friendly, nice person, and you can be an expert, or you can be a little guy saying, what's my air plant? How do I take it? And you're going to get a nice answer. Because if my members don't answer you nicely, they're gone. Why, 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 why? That's how French you raised me. That's how my grandfather, David Ander, raised me. You know, if you're going to love plants and you want to keep the plants going, you have to be friendly to people and promote them. Now, that's what our club does. This is why our yearly show is so important. I'm trying to make you understand that what you may do for selfish purposes is more important than you know. Because what? There is no central bromeliate massive collection. <laughs> like the corn or wheat storage for, you know, for these seed varieties stored in some mountain in Norway. Nobody cares about the tropical species plants. Yeah, you got great nurseries like Bullis, Bullis bromeliads. Uh, you know, I don't know if you guys, do you know who Bullis is? Guys? All right, Bullis bromeliads. Get me out of here, sorry. It's, uh, they're one of the old time Florida bullets. Sorry, well, it should come up. There it is, Homestead, Florida. Bullis, he was he, the, 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 the uh, original founder of it. He was like French. He was like one of these people that started in the 60s or 70s. Got to remember that in America, in terms of collectors and collections, you have Florida, you have Mississippi, Louisiana, Texas, you have California, you have Hawaii. 
There's a little bit in the northern states, but what? They got to spend how much for heating a greenhouse? It's minimal. And then, you know, you had somebody incredible like uh, Herb, uh, uh, just, what's his name? The one who just died recently, Herb, uh, in New York. Ah, damn it, the brain's going. Herb, Herb was a collector who was a, a staunch member of the BSI for 40 years and showed up every, he used, he grew plants, all kinds, species and uh, hybrids in an apartment in Manhattan. And he had an entire room dedicated with with, uh, you know, uh, uh, moisture control and da 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 Okay, my point is that out, outside that, you have the Germans and the Japanese who have, you know, they've become very interested. The emerging, most important, interesting people, though, collecting mainly Tillandsias, are in Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, what they call the small tigers or the medium tigers, also China. This is be incredibly giant now. If you go to Google and you say buy Tillandsias, you will get 500,000 attributions coming up. And believe me, the first 10,000 are rip off. You know, people who are, if you pay them, you'll never see anything. You have to deal with reputable people. They're being sold on eBay. They're being sold everywhere. You know, in 75 or 76, I brought him one of his, I brought him a, I was working as a uh, gardener for a friend of my parents doing orchid collections, because what? The Mexican gardeners know anything about them. And I was making good money, I was making 15 or 20 an hour. These are people, my father, uh, Robert's father, our father was a top art dealer, and we had a lot of good connections. And to a certain degree, I was able to take advantage of that while I was in high school. And I would do gardening in their hothouses. My Frenchie was selling certain Tillandsias back in 1965, but he was selling them to friends, or he was selling them to people in our club, or whatever. So what happened was you had plants that were considered by their local people to be absolute garbage. In other words, many places in Mexico, Peru, other, okay, I'm not going to get into it, they scrape them off and burn them. It's, it's a parasite. No, they're not parasites. They only live on things, they don't live from them. But my point is, it took a unique vision to see that these plants, not only were they sculptural, and not only were they like living art, which was one of my name of my first company, not only were they like living art, the fact that they could grow on nothing, you don't need soil, they only grow in air. It's something that at first people didn't want to believe. Slowly but surely, not only to believe it, you have 100,000 websites selling them. So it's an interesting thing. In that meantime, what? Stuff has been decimated. Uh, you know, I don't know if it's, you know, what do you, what do you want to talk about? Deforestation, gold mining, but it goes on and on. So uh, what it is is this. I have tried to get people interested uh, and Try to keep the interest pure. These groups are only about the love of the plants. You can't come to my group and hurt people or talk about the latest politics. There's plenty of places on Facebook to do that. So look at this. This is the uh, group header right now. Does anybody know what that is? Alcantario and Very good. And being that I'm the admin, I just want to show you how this works. We're going to change it right now. And here's the recent photos that are available today. You know, I could go, I could pick something from 10 years ago. This looks interesting. And let's go ahead and center it. And we'll save it. And we just changed the group header for 21,358 people to see. Yeah, it's on that. Well, it's funny. The ties are racing up against him, producing stuff that looks like him. So now you led me to my next thing. So let's just talk. I want to finish this by giving you an idea of how this kind of works, how, how hard it is to make hybrids, and how important large species, maintained species collections are. In other words, if you want to talk about Scotech, how does he do what he does? He has 100,000 plants just dedicated to breeding. 
Now he's in Costa Rica now. He had a lot less when he was in Texas and Florida. But, and of course you can, you know, you can focus in. In other words, you, you only need 20,000 neurogelias to have the pool of genetic library of genetic traits in which you might want to create a cross. But again, everything is like moving through lead. This plant probably took 20 or 25 years, whether it's SCOTAC or not. But anyways, so my point is that let's just do a little research. Let's try it. I just want to show you something real quick. Let's go to here. Whoops. Let's open this. I'll right, we'll go back to Bullis Brilliance later. I'm sorry. I dropped that. My point about Bullis, just so you know, uh, so Bullis Brilliance, like here's one shot. There's the facility, I mean the garden. Are they strictly wholesale? There's, yeah, they take a little bit of, but yes, you're right, basically. Bullis is phenomenal. What they said was, we're going to go opposite of the Vrezia guys, because many guys are houseplants. We're going to believe not only in species, but we're going to grow the biggest bromeliads we can. And okay, they're 65 or 85. Hey, they're worth it, because nobody else grows them, and nobody else is preserving them. Okay. A little bit, I'm wrong with that. Tropiflora, <coughs> Dennis Cathcart, also in Florida, he grows, you know, a lot of species too, but not as many of the big ones. So this is, you guys, some of you may have this, Blue Tango. Now that's a hybrid made by uh, the wife, Bullis's wife, maybe 40 years ago. And this was one of the first Ecmeas other than fasciata type plants or Shantini that made a success for Ecmeas as a commercial floral product. Nonetheless, they still have spikes on the leaves and it's, you know, it's a, to keep this color, it needs above a thousand foot candles. Uh, the great thing about Vresias and Gizmanias is they come from either the, the cloud forest to the rainforest and they're an undercarriage epiphyte. So they're growing under a muted light uh, canopy and therefore genetically they are able to carry color and to have color and exciting forms based on the, the, the biome that generated them, that gave rise to them. You follow me so far? Ecmeas tend to come from more open rocky savanna areas in the Menagerie and other parts, drier parts. There are some that come from rainforest. So the point is that you have to have a target in your mind of where you want to go if you're a hybridizer. So let's put up, let's go do this, let's go put up, uh, uh, sorry, Neo. All right. So here's Carolyn A. And if we go here, that's got images. Sorry to flack around like that, it's the only way I can do this. So Carolyn A, there was a regular a regular Carolyn A like this, but the Carolyn A we're interested in is this one. And uh, let's see if we get a larger image. Nah, it's the same thing. Okay. So this is tricolor striata. And this came to Europe very early on. Uh, nobody knows, but maybe in the 1850s. But the Belgians and the Dutch started working with it in the 50s and 60s. And they, they this is a, so it's a naturally occurring. Hi, uh, naturally occurring variegation. Most variegation in vermilions, when we actually say variegation, we're referring to striation, meaning the long linear lines along the axle of the leaf. If you talk about patterning or modeling, that's a different, completely different thing. So what if you wanted to give this plant tiger stripes? Well, that's essentially what Scotech did. George, uh, Chester Skotak did. But you know how many steps that took? That probably took 20 or 30 years. Now, what you get though, so let's go real quickly, let's go Chester. Skotak, there he is. He's become a very good friend of mine. Uh, this is funny, this is a classic. This was his private collection of variegated Alcantarias. Are we almost done? Yeah, okay, no problem. Thanks, Paul. Thanks for coming. So, you know, this is maybe, I was already maybe 10 years ago. And, <coughs> what, I mean, can you imagine the, the sheer perseverance it takes 
When he had to go out in the forest to get these, or fly to Japan, or fly to Germany, he tracked them down, grew these, and used them for hybridizing, and has come up with some great stuff. Let's just go back to the, uh, make the point. So here's Chester's, again, wrong Facebook. Sorry, I jump around a lot. Here's Chester's photos. So, you know, you have to be a friend to be able to see this stuff, but it's not hard. Usually people will friend you pretty easily. Here's Dr. Chester. Here's, yeah, it's, it's uh, mainly uh, Eloise in Florida. That's, this is brand new, unnamed. And you can see how, in a certain way, this makes you think of Milagro. The first thing we started out looking at on the intro page. And it may have some similar parentage. We don't know. Uh, here's the point. Uh, this one of the key reasons again, you know, I don't love Facebook. I wish they'd make me a billionaire. But you know what they did? They gave me access to be able to promote the plants. And if you if you friend people, the right people, there's a lot of good reasons to have good talks about plants. And you leave all the other crap aside. Uh, you know, what they're doing with their manipulation of politics in America, I hate. I just tell you straight up, I hate it. But, geez, if the billionaires want to give me 325 websites, meaning my planets, and give me uncounted huge memory storage, which is what I have for each group. You know, my top, my top 50 groups are over 10,000 each. And then my top 10 are 25 to 30,000. And they're 10 years of history. These guys are giving me a lot of capability. So what am I going to do with that? Well, the first thing you do with it is you keep people friendly and you talk about the plants. Let's see. It's got a Chester's photos instead of that. All right, so now, you know, get ready to be blown away. What Chester has been working on for 30 years is pineapples. And he has, he was one of the first ones to create a small miniature spineless Pineapple. You may have seen him at Trader Joe's. Yeah. Okay. He started that. He had one of those going 25 years ago. Wow. It's a tasteless thing. It's not, it's not meant to be eaten. These are all kinds of brand new hybrids. Here, here's a crested, bizarre mutant. I, I, know, I don't want to go into the whole history of pineapples, but the point is this. What you had, Del Monte and, 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 and what's their names, you know, Dole. For years, you had what was called Ananas Camosis, and the key hybrid was called Smooth Cayenne. And that, that one hybrid took 20 years to make. But as you guys know, many of you know, in the past, pineapples were what? Mainly acidic, mainly large. Yes, you could, you know, you could ripen them and get a sweet fruit, and then it lasted what? A day or two at the most? What, what, what uh, Chester's doing now, is turning his genius towards pineapples to do three major things. Make them sweeter, like the current one, which is in all the markets, it's called gold. And that is actually its name. It was not a hybrid, it was a sport, a clone, what we call a cultivar. But the entire industry gravitated that way because of two things. It had a medium-sized weight, it was very sweet and lower acid, still has acid, but lower, but the main thing about it was, it had refrigeration and shelf life, and it kept its sweetness after all the trucking and shipping. So it was an ideal commercial product. Well, Chester said, not only do I want to make red and purple pineapples, I want to make miniature ones. I want to make one that's the size of an apple, but sweeter than an apple, and it fits in a kid's lunchbox. And he's doing it. That's only 200 grand. And that has a bricks, a sweetness of 15%, 15 percent. Can points. I ask you a question? Sure. Do they have people started um, banking DNA of these plants? What I'm trying to tell you is nobody's doing anything. It's sickening. Sorry to scream. It, yes, to a certain degree, Del Monte and Dole. Oh, yeah, you gotta, wait, you gotta know something. Wait, you gotta something. Wait, 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 wait. There is no way to bank anything. 
You can't take cell cultures of this. You can keep them alive in the lab as clones to a certain amount of time, but they go, they do what's called monoclonal, or they go, or they go bad. You have to have an active pool of what? Species! And that's what they do. They have secret gardens. I, I know this because I study this stuff. They have secret gardens in Costa Rica and Guyana and the Philippines. And they do nothing but maintain their hybrids that they're researching and their species. And at a certain point, you say, you know what? I'm 65, you're blocking my way. I'm going elsewhere. And he's got backing out of several countries, Philippines, Germany, etc. And he's going to pursue his miniature pineapples. Remember, this is a man who plants, I've told you the guys this before, he can plant a half a million seeds from his crosses a year and throw out 4,900 I'm sorry, yeah, 499,000. In other words, he might have a thousand plants after three or five years that he thinks are worth keeping, and then out of those he'll throw out more. You say, what a waste. No, it's not a waste because he's trying to create perfect plants. He's not interested in crappy backyard hybrids, and I'm not trying to insult any of you, but by and large, up until the up until Chester and the people like Don Beetle out of Florida and some of the Belgians and Dutch, hybrids were willy-nilly. Most of them are crappy, just being honest. They have leaves going one way, they don't have good confirmation. What Chester brought to Neergelias and to many other plants was not only a sense of the broad understanding of what traits and what beautiful characteristics were available in the world of Vermilions. But he had the artistic vision of which plants to combine with each other and then to do that over 10, 20, 30 years to end up with these absolutely improved and better plants. Uh, let's give you an example. So these are, look, here's a red skin, just so you see. It's really red and that's ripe. So it's a very, so what, just to give you some concept, how much are pineapples? How much is the market a year? About 4.5 billion with a B. That's for live fruit, dried fruit, juice, okay, it's everything. And you still gotta grow the damn things. It's a highly toxic crop. You know, that's the first thing anybody who knows their stuff <coughs> will tell you. <coughs> but <coughs> so here's somebody, you know, they, again, no names, this is just new stuff. You're looking at stuff. No one has access to this except if you go to my planets or if you know Chester on Facebook. You know, the BSI is great. I don't try to, you know, insult them. But the journal is limited to certain top chosen people. It comes six, six months late. And hey, they're not a rich, it's not a rich society. So power to them. But. If you want to know what's really got the pulse of what's new in Vermilions, you got to come to my planets, and I'll show you why. So that's, you know, yeah, okay, I'll wrap it up. Uh, do I have five minutes? Okay. So, you know, this, I mean, this goes on and on. He has, he has probably 5,000 of his own photos. And these are all, this is all new stuff. This is, you know, you say, well, that looks like a good many I have. No, it doesn't. Look how many flowers. Look at the size. Look at the confirmation. Brand new, unnamed, don't know what it is, you have to talk to Chester. And he only releases certain things that he feels meets his, you know, meets his goals. And that, that looks like other things you've seen from him, but it's not the same. All right, so here's my point. Let's just go back to the plant lands here for one minute, because, you know, the problem is I have too much to tell you. There's not enough time to tell you all of it. And you know, carry on. I think you got the point. The point is, something has to be done to save vermilion species. We're all going to die anyways. Climate change is going to, yeah, whatever. <laughs> you can get as pessimistic as you want. I'm still trying. I'm still optimistic. I'm still hoping humanity can figure something out and stops killing itself. Uh, I do, my attitude was, the one thing I can do is encourage my fellow plant people to love plants. This is the most basic thing that French had taught me. 
give me one minute. Let me just finish what I'm saying. So, I did all this, I've done this for 10 years. You're talking 16,500 hours of my life. And sure, part of that is me having fun, posting plants, talking to people, but by and large, it's administrating, making sure nobody hurts anybody else, screams it right. So, but what I did the other day was I realized it's time to preserve the species. And so I started a new group, a new page called the Vermilion Species Conservation Network. There it is. I announced it on, this is 24 hours ago, I announced it on the planets, and we have what, do you see a number? Should be a number. Where's the number? There it is. All right, so we only have 126 people. Something that would actually be an NGO or a, you know, a, a, a nonprofit corporation. And so what? We would focus on three or four things. Keeping people interested, sponsoring collections in universities and public botanical gardens, and trying our hardest to preserve habitat. Because if we as collectors and as lovers of these plants don't get involved, it's all gone. It's all gone. All right. I think you've had enough proselytizing. And, uh, you know, we'll talk some other time about, remember, with just one last thing I say, with this search mode in the bigger planets, you can find anything. It's, way, it's, it's much better than Google. The retailers aren't going to show you the, the, the rare plants. So find me on there. You can find it easy. Plant, really, plant, plant. Sorry, yeah. are you in Google or are no, you? No, we're, we're jumping around. This is Facebook. Okay. See the app? Okay. okay. No, yeah, we're on Facebook. Sorry. Okay. I, I moved too quick. I know yes. that. I'm sorry. But anyways, love your plants. Make sure, make sure you get a grandchild or a nephew or even a younger neighbor, a neighbor next door. Give them a pup. Talk to them. Get them into the plants. Bring them to our show. Sign them up. Okay, off my soapbox. Have fun. Thank you for putting up with me.